everybody. My name is Donna Gerson and I'm the Associate Dean at Drexel University's Thomas R. Klein School of Law. And I am in charge of the Career Strategies Office. This is Career Explorations. And tonight we focus on careers in immigration law. You will meet three amazing graduates from the Drexel Klein School of Law and a professor who is working at the intersection of immigration and policy issues. So immigration law encompasses a wide range of situations. It's in the news. Um, if you saw any of the news today from the Biden administration about executive orders, you will know that this is important information um, about that impacts every aspect of a person's life in so many ways. And for the right person, this can be the right legal niche for you. So I'm going to start by introducing you to a faculty member who is held in high esteem, Professor Anil Kalhan. Um, we'll say a few words. His scholarly and teaching interests lie in the areas of immigration law, US and comparative constitutional law, international human rights law, privacy and surveillance, criminal law, and law in South Asian studies. We've placed in the chat his bio so you can see his amazing accomplishments. I will add that, that before becoming a law professor, he worked at the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project, working on high profile impact litigation arising from the 1996 immigration laws, including two Supreme Court cases and served as co-coordinator of the Immigration and Human Rights Pro Bono Practice Group at Cleary Gottlieb, Steen and Hamilton, both in New York City. He is active in the New York City Bar Association, including as a member of the Immigration Committee and as chair of its International Human Rights Committee. It is my honor to present to you, Professor Anil Kalhan. Thanks so much, Dean Gerson. It's great to see so many people interested in immigration law issues. It's obviously become an area of tremendous interest over the last few years. We've certainly seen a lot more students interested in immigration law, um, but it's been a very dynamic and rewarding area of legal practice for a long time uh, with enormous community need and great opportunities for folks starting out their careers as lawyers. Um, you know, many of the changes over the last few years have not been so great for immig immigrant communities and for non-citizens, and that's made the field a challenging one and a demanding one to work in, but also a very exciting and rewarding one um, as um, our alums who are working in the field, I'm sure we'll, we'll have a lot more to say about. Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time from them. I'm really excited to hear what they have to say and share about what they've been doing since I last saw all of them. But um, you know, there, there are a number of things happening at the law school with the growing interest that we've been trying to do to make it a more um, coherent and hospitable place for people with an interest in these issues. So I'm really going to say a couple things. Um, really two categories of things to, to speak to. One is actually in probably a counterintuitive order, I'm going to talk about courses not first, um, that might, uh, if you're a current student, by way of advice, if you're prospective students, also by way of advice, um, uh, in terms of how you might structure your time in law school um, to make the most of the experience. So first, and here's the counterintuitive part, maybe most important, I really want to encourage everyone to make the time to become proactively engaged outside of class in extracurricular and co-curricular activities concerning immigration law. Um, I don't think that this is the advice that law students always get. Sometimes I think they are pushed in the opposite direction to focus exclusively on courses. But I think especially for folks interested in immigration law, it's vital to do more than that. Um, we have now a very active immigration law society. It's one of the more active student organizations on campus. Um, with great thanks to Becca Swaintech for, for really giving it a jump start a few years ago. Um, and I would encourage all of you to become involved in what they're doing. We now have a, a border rights project, which uh, the pandemic has complicated to some extent. It was originally contemplated as a spring break project uh, in El Paso, Texas, working with a couple of partner organizations there. Um, this year, we're doing things remotely with a leading by national organization in Tijuana, Mexico, uh, al otro lado. Um, so, uh, but you know, there are lots of other things that the organization does and, and can do if you get involved and don't see the precise things that you want to see happen. Um, outside of Drexel, uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, I want to really emphasize, has a wealth of resources 
And as of uh, about a month ago, membership for law students is free. Uh, membership for practicing lawyers is exorbitantly expensive. Um, so while you're in law school, if you have any interest in the area, uh, there's really zero reason not to take advantage of becoming a student member of AILA. Um, and then finally, I would just encourage folks to attend events and learn as much as you can um, from people who are doing work in the field, scholars who are thinking about the leading issues um, that are arising. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is that a lot of the things that are happening at other law schools and in the community are much more readily available because everything is happening online. Um, so I've been trying to encourage students to take advantage of that while we can to sort of leverage the opportunity and I would encourage all of you to do that as well. In terms of courses, um, you know, I know this is another sort of slightly counterintuitive thing um, from the Drexel brand perspective. Um, experiential learning, there are enormous experiential learning opportunities and Dean Gerson, um, I think, either has or will circulate some of the resources in terms of particular co-op opportunities and so on. I wanted to say a couple things about courses. So in terms of immigration law courses, we're trying to develop more of a coherent sequence for folks who are interested in, in this area. So starting with the immigration law survey course and then proceeding into uh, an advanced immigration law course in the spring. And then, of course, there are a lot of other experiential learning, the Federal Litigation Clinic and, and uh, various co-op opportunities. But I also want to emphasize a strong foundation in non-immigration law courses, um, that that is pretty important too. Things like administrative law, criminal procedure, labor and employment law, a variety of other things that the precise mix will depend on what's being offered and you know, what your specific interests might be. But this is one thing about immigration law as a field. It's a complex area that demands deep expertise into a particular statute that is very, very technical. And uh, as you develop that really deep expertise, it's important to not lose sight of the breadth of knowledge of other fields in order to bring creative thinking to bear on problems um, that clients might face. Or, and it's harder to get that knowledge later for the first time if you haven't built the right kind of strong foundation in law school. So I think that's all I want to say. Um, uh, if folks have questions, I'm, of course, available. Um, if not at this meeting, because I may not be able to stay till the end, um, uh, certainly uh, you, you should feel free to contact me separately. Well, thank you so much, Professor Calhan. And now it is my pleasure to introduce three amazing graduates who are all practicing in the area of immigration law. Um, we have with us tonight, Christina Haynes, class of 2014, Daniel Hendrickson, class of 2014, and Rebecca Swaintech, our newest graduate from the class of 2020. Hi, everyone. So um, as Dean Gerson said, my name is Christina Haynes and I graduated from the law school in 2014. I live with my family in McLean, Virginia, which is right outside Washington, DC. Um, and I work in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I work as a senior attorney at Erickson Immigration Group. And this is um, a firm that focuses on business immigration. So employment-based immigration. Um, and I really wanted to pursue a career in immigration because I really wanted to work in a field where I'm interacting with clients on a daily basis. And I feel like I'm helping um, clients to achieve their goals. That was something that was super important for me. Um, and it's been a really great fit. Um, it's been something that I've been able to combine with having a family and it's just been a wonderful experience for me. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Hendrickson. I also graduated in the class of 2014 from the law school. I live in Roseville, Minnesota, which is right outside of Minneapolis, which is where I work. Um, I work as a staff attorney in the Immigration Law Project at Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid, which is the largest um, nonprofit legal service provider in Minnesota. And we primarily do affirmative, what we call humanitarian um, immigration applications. And so things like applying for citizenship, green cards, some family-based. And we also do removal defense for detained individuals, as well as unaccompanied alien children or UACs, if you ever hear that uh, term used. And I chose to pursue immigration um, as a career because I grew up in a small rural farming community. So I had a lot of interaction with migrant farm workers and immigrants starting from a young age. And a lot of the population growth where I'm from was from immigrants. And so I really found all of the stories from the people I was meeting very interesting and I wanted to keep meeting more immigrants and hearing their stories. 
Um, and I also just saw the importance to communities um, and building strong communities that immigrants can bring, um, kind of revitalizing small areas as well as large areas. And I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, helping families stay together. And I find that it's a really rewarding area. It's very difficult, especially in the last four years, um, but that makes the wins that you get even more rewarding. Um, and I just really also like that client interaction like Christina said. Hi, as Dean Garrison said, my name is uh, Rebecca and I just graduated last year in 2020 um, in the pandemic, it was great. Um, I currently live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I work for the U.S. Department of Justice through the Honors Program. I am a judicial law clerk with the Executive Office of Immigration Review um, the, uh, in the York Immigration Court. So the York Court is a detained docket only, so I see a large variety of cases, but there's a heavy focus on the overlap of immigration and criminal law, which is what I intend to focus my practice on um, in the future future, um, helping non-citizens that have found themselves in the intersection of criminal law and immigration law. Um, so like I said, I'm a judicial law clerk there. And the reason I got interested in immigration law, uh, right after I graduated from undergrad, I began working as a social worker at a shelter for unaccompanied alien children, um, like we already said, UACs. And I loved my job and I knew I was either going to go back and get an MSW and work in the realm of refugee resettlement or go to law school. And so I got a job at a law firm as a secretary and decided, you know, I really wanted to be an advocate, um, helping non-citizens tell their stories and use their most of the time trauma um, in order to find their safety and, you know, be able to, to live here safely without fear of getting caught up in our immigration system. Um, and so that's where I am now. So I wanted to take a moment and begin by asking Christina, what is what does private practice actually mean in terms of what your law firm does um, and how how your how your clients find their way to the firm? So private practice um, in the immigration context means that my firm represents American companies um, throughout the United States, and we're helping them to bring in and secure foreign national talent. So foreign nationals who are coming to the U.S. to work on different work visas like H-1B, L-1, O-1, um, TN, all the different work visas. And then we also assist those employees and their families all the way through um, the green card process until they get their green cards in the U.S. Um, so my firm in particular, our clients are wide range. We have a lot of tech companies, social media companies, video game companies. So I've learned a lot about video games. Um, design design companies, product design, industrial design. So it's really a wide range. Um, and it's kind of interesting because as immigration lawyers, we're in a unique spot because we represent the company, but we're also helping the individual and their family to obtain their visas. So we kind of have this interesting dual representation going on, um, you know, where sometimes, you know, the clients come to us with what might be criminal issues or other issues and we kind of need to navigate that um delicately and you know we're, we're helping them and then we're also obviously helping the the companies who are recruiting these individuals and need them to fulfill very specific roles um, i personally focus mainly on um, o1 visas for individuals of extraordinary ability so these are really leaders in the top of their field so i get to kind of learn about what their field is and really explain that to the immigration officer so we are filing work visa petitions directly with USCIS. They go to the government and they're reviewed by one USCIS officer. So you really need to make a good case and convince that officer to approve the visa. Um, and just as D Danielle said, we've seen that um, that's become a lot harder in the past four years for work visas like it has across the board for immigration. Um, so we're always strategizing on how to really secure the best results for our client, make the process really smooth for them Many people, um, you know, they're relocating to the US, they're nervous about the process, they're not sure if their visa is gonna get approved, they're not sure what the situation is gonna be like for their family when they come here. So we really try to um, guide the employees through the process, make it seem seamless and easy to them, even though really we know that sometimes it's a struggle to get USAS to approve these cases. 
Thank you. So there's a there's a trial aspect to this, there's prep aspect, there's a lot of client advising involved. So Danielle, in a public interest organization, can you talk a little bit about how that is different and what that means to your practice? Uh, so the large, the, the main difference, um, I would say are the clients that we serve and um, how we're funded. So we are funded by grants, um, funds from foundations. We get some um, general funds from our state legislature and then donations from private individuals. So our work is really dependent on what the grants are and what they call grant deliverables. So how many people we have to see and specific types of cases those grants will allow us to cover. Um, and we are only able to serve people if they are under uh, technically, it's 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. Um, it's like under 200% with exceptions for taking out costs for rent and medical bills and some other things that individuals might have to pay for. And then we also can help seniors um, uh, regardless of their income. And we have, because of the grants that we have and just our, our place in the community, we have a lot of organization um, partnerships and community partnerships. And so we see people who self-refer, so just call or come to our door because they have a legal need. We see a lot of people who are referred to us from social workers, case workers. Um, we have um, you know, people who are maybe working with, um, so one of our grants is under the Violence Against Women Act. So a lot of what we do is working with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And so they may be working with a social service provider, um, getting counseling, things like that, and then have a legal need. So they're referred directly to us. Um, and so it's really great in some ways that we are funded in that way. And we have those strong community partnerships. Uh, we're never lacking for clients, <laughs> but capacity gets to be an issue and um, you know, having the funds to cover all of the work that we do and having to turn people away at times, um, but it's really great because when a client comes to us, we get to kind of help them um, with the whole picture of their life. So um, my unit specifically is one unit within a larger organization. So we can refer people if they have housing issues or employment issues or other consumer issues within our organization. Um, and then we can also refer back to community organizations, social service organizations for more wraparound services and counseling. Um, we have a couple of grants to fund our detained work. And so then we have done, um, they call them, it's through the legal orientation program. Um, and so we have uh, outreach to specific ICE detention centers in Minnesota and people identify that they need representation and we do intakes with them and identify people who could qualify. That way we also, um, our organization is the, um, the organization in Minnesota for the National Qualified Representation Program. Um, so if there's somebody in uh, detention or in removal proceedings who has competency issue and mental health issues and they need to have representation to help them um, because representation is not guaranteed. Everyone has a right to it in immigration court, but it's not provided at government expense. Um, but in these specific situations, the court um, will try to identify counsel for individuals who have capacity issues. And so we're an organization that would take cases like that. Um, we at our organization also specialize in other cases where there are mental health issues. So we see a lot of referrals from the refugee resettlement agencies, especially for individuals who have um, different bipolar disorder, um, other psychoses, um, PTSD, severe depression, things like that. So we are getting clients who are sometimes in very unstable situations, which can make it hard. Um, and we do have limited resources, but something that's really great I find with working in the public interest field is that holistic piece of the services. And if somebody comes to us, um, you know, and they've identified their problem is I need a work permit. And then we identify, well, you're eligible for all these different types of status or applications. We can help them with every one of those, um, you know, so long as they fit into a grant um, and we're not limited to just what they're asking for or just what they can pay for, um, which is something that 
that I find really rewarding about working in public interest. And Rebecca, our, our newest graduate from the class of 2020, if you can tell us a little bit about your work um, in the US Department of Justice and how you got there, I think it would be really interesting for our students uh, to hear. Sure. Um, so I believe the only way you can clerk within the Executive Office of Immigration Review, I am in the Office of the Chief Immigration Judge, like I said, at the York Immigration Court. And the only way to get there is through the Department of Justice Honors Program, which might sound scary and competitive and fancy, but don't let that intimidate you wherever you are, prospective student or current student. Um, you have to apply through the Department of Justice. Um, I believe Ina has already linked um, the website for that information. Um, and it's a two-year clerkship um, at the federal level. So it's you know on the regular GS pay scale like other clerkships. Um, one thing that's different from other clerkships though, um, as far as I know, at least York is this way, we work with all of the judges at the court. So it's not like I'm assigned to one specific judge and only work in chambers of one judge. I'm working with, there are currently four judges at the York Immigration Court. And sometimes we get assigned cases from uh, the Falls Church Immigration Adjudication Center down in Virginia. You know, one of those judges will need extra help or, or, or things along those lines. And in terms of the day-to-day -day job, um, it's, it's writing the decisions for the judges, um, decisions, uh, motions, research, kind of whatever the judge has going on that they might need help with. Um, the last administration put quotas on the immigration judges that they're expected to finish a certain amount of cases in a certain amount of time and, and things like that, um, which I think increased the amount of work that was thrown to the judicial law clerks. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, because we've been very, very busy, even during the pandemic. Um, we've been, there's only two clerks right now. We will have four next year and it's been um, very busy, but that means that I got thrown into some of the most complex analyses that I think a lot of associates don't get um, at firms or at nonprofits right away um, in terms of immigration law and the more difficult sides of things. Um, I've, you know, I wrote a 37 page decision in a week the other day doing, in my opinion, the most complex part of immigration law. Um, and it was really rewarding. And I had the judge and my um, peers to lean on. Um, in terms of the honors program generally, um, once you're a judicial law clerk, if you're doing well, um, you can, and you get the offer, you can stay on as um, an attorney advisor, and that is a permanent position within the agency. So my direct supervisor, she did her two years at the Omaha Immigration Court and then transferred to the York Immigration Court where she is now um, a permanent attorney advisor. Um, sorry, I think my dog just barked. I'm not sure if you can hear it. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I wanna say in terms of the honors program is during our training, um, the, the, it was done by immigration judges and uh, judges on the Board of Immigration Appeals and higher leadership, including, including the chief immigration judge. Um, a lot of them started as JLCs and then they've worked their way through. If you're interested in, I'm obviously talking about from the court side, the, there's also a strong funnel, I believe, from the JLCs into DHS to become a trial attorney, attorney for the DHS, which then um, argues for, you know, the removal of non-citizens in court. Um, and you can also get a clerkship with the Office of Immigration Litigation, um, which argues appeals on behalf of the government. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and um, there's, there's various levels with immigration. I think it's the, one of the best places to start because you get to see a variety of things. Um, I was telling Dean Gerson yesterday, <laughs> My supervisor is working on a case that was argued by and handled by Mary Kramer, which is the author of a textbook that I used in my independent study with um, Professor Calhoun. Um, so yes, and the way that I got there was there was a SLIP program, a summer legal intern program through the Department of Justice. I don't think it exists anymore for the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Um, at least with the Office of the Chief Immigration Judge. If you're interested in OIL, which is the Office of Immigration Litigation, you can still go that way. Um, but I was able to get an offer through that. Um, so I kind of got to bypass some of the more difficult parts of the honors program. Um, but it, it was great. I'm very happy where I am.
you talked about how you you funneled your way in with some really great experience, including the SLIP Summer Legal Intern Program, which kind of got you to the attention of going into the Honors Program, which was the next step in this very prestigious process. I want to spend a little time talking to everybody about the foundations that you made while you were in law school for first summer, second summer, et cetera, where you built your resume. What experience did what experiences did you have um, and what would you recommend that our listeners think about when they're going through law school? So for my first summer, I was an intern for the um, Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, um, which was something that the law school helped me to apply for. Um, and it was a really, um, really great summer. <clears throat> and um, as kind of as Rebecca mentioned, I was helping the attorneys like Rebecca who were there with starting to write some decisions that were then reviewed by the judges. Um, and so that was really exciting. And we did see federal immigration cases. The Third Circuit has issued a lot of decisions on immigration. Um, so that um, was, was a good fit for me. And then my second summer, I was um, a, a, a summer associate at a law firm um, in Philadelphia, um, Duane Morris. Um, and um, that was kind of a, a good fit for me because I had actually worked at that firm prior to joining law school was one of the reasons I wanted to go to law school. So I looked at a lot of different firms, but ended up, ended up going there, I think, because um, I kind of had a sense of community there. Um, but I did do a lot of kind of networking while I was there, and I really tried to figure out which area of practice would I want to be in. Um, and then ultimately, I was able to my first job was working for that firm, um, but by that point, my husband and I had moved to the DC area. So the networking I had done kind of within that firm enabled me to, um, to have a position. And I kind of, um, there's a wonderful attorney there who's the former president of ALA, which is the organization that Professor Callahan was talking about. And I kind of reached out to her and let her know my interest. And then she kind of took me under her wing, which is how I was able to get really my first job in, in immigration and private practice. So, um, so definitely encourage you to always be kind of um, reaching out and making connections. It's not something that comes naturally to me at all. So I really had to force myself to do that. But I would say each step of the way gave me a little bit more confidence to do so. Um, and you just really need to kind of take it um, one day at a time, one step at a time. Um, and also watch watching other people, um, how they kind of so for instance, watching the other interns at the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, how they would um, interact with and, and gather information from the attorneys there, I kind of would watch that and say, okay, maybe I can do this too. Maybe I can build some of these relationships. That's It's a great point because, you know, one of the assumptions we make at the Klein School of Law is that you've never done this before. And so our office is set up to help you figure out how to do this. And if we don't know, we'll figure out how to, we'll find out for you um, and help you do it. But we also really stress these foundational issues that, it's important to gain legal experience of some kind first summer, second summer if you have if you're on the three year program, you know, uh, co op. We'll be talking about that later, um, and all manner of experiences to build your resume. Um, so Danielle, tell us next, what were your like foundational experiences? Sure. So I always knew I wanted to do public interest. Um, I never really ventured outside of that, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, my first summer, I um, worked at Philly VIP. Um, and so their model is that they take cases that need pro bono representation, and they connect them to attorneys to do them pro bono. And they provide um, case management as well as resources for the attorneys. So they do a lot of um, continuing legal education and kind of clinics um, where they educate attorneys on the specific issues and prepare them to take a case for pro bono representation. Um, it was not at all related to immigration, but it was a really great foundation in public interest law. Um, I was exposed to a wide variety of issues. I got to write training materials. Um, for the other attorneys, I got to help at these clinics. So it was really a great model for me. And, um, you know, if you are in the public interest, there probably will be some pro bono aspect to your case and providing assistance to attorneys that are taking pro bono 
So it was really great kind of in learning how to manage both clients, but attorneys who are working with clients um, and how clinics are operated or like, you know, like, so one day legal service clinics like that. Um, and because of that model, it was really great to meet attorneys who were doing all sorts of different types of law, um, usually in private practice, who were just, you know, getting pro bono hours through these cases. So it was really great for networking both within the public interest field, as well as um, some networking with the private bar. Um, and then my second summer, I actually interned um, at the organization where I work now, um, in the unit that I work now. And so um, by that point, I was pretty sure I wanted to do immigration. Um, I was kind of wavering between immigration and labor law um, and really interested in the intersection in that, but knew I wanted to get back to Minnesota. And uh, so I just researched organizations um, that did that work. And I think I cold emailed the person who ended up being my supervisor. Um, and we set up a phone, kind of an informational phone interview that turned into a phone interview for a summer position. Um, and it worked out really great. Um, and I will say, and we'll talk more about co-ops later, um, but going into it, my 2L year, with the co-op experiences I had had and the 1L summer I had, had um, I was pretty ready to do the work. Um, so I was able to not only do research and writing, which is a lot of what interns get to do, but I actually represented clients. So I met individually with clients, filled out forms with them, um, you know, and attorneys have to supervise your work and sign off on everything. Um, but it was really, really great because I actually did the work. Um, and it prepared me very well and obviously ultimately led to me getting the, the job that I have now. I have a, a question um, about language skills. Um, do you speak a, 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 another language? I do, I speak Spanish. Um, so again, um, coming from a farm community and migrant workers, um, I started speaking Spanish from a fairly young age and then I always studied it in school. Um, and it was one of my majors in undergrad, but it has been hugely helpful. Um, and I wouldn't call it a requirement that you speak a second language because you can always find interpreters, but it is very helpful um, when you are talking to a client to be able to communicate with them directly in their language. So I mean, I have plenty of clients that speak Somali and Arabic and other languages where I do have to use an interpreter. And I can say just in that comparison of using an interpreter versus talking to somebody yourself in their own language makes a big difference just in the communication, uh, the ease of communication, but also just like building kind of that rapport and respect with your clients that can be very important when you're building, you know, say an asylum case or a case where you're really having to get some nitty gritty details about a client's life and making them feel comfortable. Um, so it's not, like I said, not required, but it is very helpful. Okay, thank you. No, it, you know, it, it's interesting to think about all the things that we can do to prepare ourselves. Um, I want to shift a little bit to academics and the courses you took in law school. I'll make an observation that immigration law seems to encompass a lot, touches a lot of different areas. It, it touches family law and criminal law and labor and employment law, um, just to name a few. Um, what courses do you think really stood out for you when you went to law school that were helpful? So I took my 2L year, I took immigration law with Professor Calhan, um, which was, as he called it, a survey course, going over everything pretty much. Um, I think in that same semester, I had refugee and asylum law with Judge Morley, who was an immigration judge at the Philadelphia Immigration Court. Um, and then we ended up taking the subway at the same time home. So I was able to, I picked his brain on everything that I could, including the honors program. Um, he gave me some invaluable advice for that. Um, so he's an absolute uh, great resource at the law school. Um, my 2L summer, I actually uh, began the, the what's now the Border Rights Project. Five of us went down. Um, I fundraised money so that five of us could go down and get that hands-on experience down in El Paso. Um, I had tried to get it going during 1L year when the children were being separated from their um, parents and it wasn't something that you can just up and make happen spontaneously. So at that point, I reached out to Professor Calhoun and other people within the, uh, within the university generally. And we were able to get five going my 2L year and turn it into a much larger thing by my 3L year, which the pandemic unfortunately interrupted. But 
Um, it is in good hands with the student leadership that's still there. Um, I know some of you are on this call um, as well as Professor Calhan. Um, and then my 3L year, I was part of the Federal Litigation and Appeals Clinic at the school. So I did not choose to do a co-op. I chose to do a clinic at school. So that is uh, two semesters. So it was my full 3L year. Um, and I got a variety of experiences. I filed appeals uh, with both the Board of Immigration Appeals and then some of the circuit courts. We did a Fifth Circuit Appeal and a Third Circuit Appeal. I represented someone in removal proceedings. Uh, so I was able to do a full trial with my um, co-counsel, one of my classmates, um, and we were able to help him get his green card, which was, it was great. And it was one of the best parts, in my opinion, was being able to do a direct examination with my professor, Professor Hoofy, sitting right next to me to be able to prod me if I needed it. I wasn't on my own or, you know, with a partner that may not have, you know, paid much attention to the details of the case and was relying on me or something. I had a professor that was, you know, she walked us through every step of the way um, ahead of time. We were able to do a full mock trial with my within the clinic with my class, um, our um, yeah, the, 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 the gentleman was able to come in during school hours so that we were able to do it together. So I love that as my introduction, as my introduction to, you know, litigation and immigration law, because I, I was able to do it with like a team surrounding me. My classmates were in there and everything. Um, and my 3L year, uh, Professor Kalhan and I created an independent study in advanced immigration law, which we tailored to um, my, um, interest in the overlap of criminal and immigration law. Um, and I was able to do a seminar paper analyzing a Supreme Court case that I believe still hasn't come out yet because I think the pandemic, I'm not sure. Um, but so my kind of story on that is if it isn't there, you can work with Klein Law School to make it happen. Um, because I, as Professor Kalhan said in the beginning, there wasn't a student organization focused on immigration. So I created the Immigration Law Society with his help and that's still going. Um, and the Border Rights Project, I'm happy to say, seems to still be going. So if it's not there, you can you can make it happen at Klein. I know that sounds very, I promise that admissions did not pay me to say that or anything like that. That's legitimately just what my experience was. And, and I would echo that students who have initiative and take the, the, the take control of the situation are able to do so many interesting and exciting things from independent study with faculty members to creating your own co-op. If, if there isn't a co-op that you that exists, you can work on creating a co-op that works for you. Um, and we'll talk a little later about the difference between um, co-op and clinic both experiential learning. But let me um, turn to Danielle and to Christina just to ask about their academic choices um, and what really stood out for you. Yeah, so Christina, I both took immigration law with Judge Morley um, and I took refugee and asylee law with him. And I agree, it was, just, it was great. And as a practitioner now, I really appreciate having learned from an immigration judge, even though you know immigration court in Philadelphia is very different than our Fort Snelling immigration court in the eighth circuit here in Minnesota. Um, I took admin law, which isn't something that's required, but just because immigration is administrative based and especially with all of these executive orders and challenges in court about the Administrative Procedures Act, it's really just a helpful baseline of understanding what is the argument that's happening here and why, why does it matter? Um, Obviously, like your read, your research and writing skills are important. So those classes that you're required to take, um, even though they can be a struggle and not very fun, um, I think those are really helpful. Um, I didn't do great at, at crim law at the time, was not super interested in it, but criminal law impacts immigration a lot. There are a lot of Im immigration consequences. So I think that would be important. Um, and I did take labor law, employment discrimination law, um, because I was also interested in that. But you do see those issues come up with immigrants um, and people being discriminated because of their immigration status. So if you're at all interested in that intersection um, or just wanna be able to kind of advise clients more broadly, I think, I think those are helpful. Um, and my last semester, I was at the law school, so my fall semester of 3L year, because um, I did co-op second semester, um, I did, there was a seminar that Dean um, Filler had that was, can't remember the title of it, but it was something about like community effects of um, of, 
uh, detained individuals, prison, um, prisoner rights and things like that. Um, and I think that any of those kinds of seminars based, if you're interested in public interest law, any of those seminars that are kind of based on community impacts of the law are really helpful um, in framing um, just kind of your own advocacy, but also thinking about managing clients and working with clients and kind of understanding the experiences that they're going through. Um, so any, any opportunity that you can have to kind of get that, um, those skills and that information I think is helpful. As Danielle mentioned, we took immigration law together with Judge Morley. I took several courses with Professor Calhoun that really, um, I think, set me on the right path um, in terms of um, some of the policy perspectives and some of the larger issues that were going on in, in immigration that you don't always learn about um, in a traditional law school class. Um, and I also took criminal law with Professor Calhoun, which is very extremely helpful if, if you're going to be pursuing immigration law, even in private practice like I am. We do see criminal issues come up from time to time and being able to read a criminal statute from a given state is, is incredibly important, or at least sometimes even if I'm not um, going to have all the answers, I can point the client in the right direction, which is really helpful. Um, the other one I would call out is trial. I took some trial courses with Professor Stern. And um, I'm not a trial attorney now, but in my previous at my previous firm, um, I did go into immigration court sometimes, and we were defending, you know, in defensive removal proceedings. Um, and um, that was it's just a wonderful skill set to have, um, especially if you're like me. Maybe you're not a natural public speaker, but that class forced us to really um, do some public speaking and. Pre-COVID days, we were even recorded on camera and had to watch ourselves on camera and that sort of thing. So um, I think that's a really good course to have on your radar, even if you're not going to be a trial attorney, some of the skills that you get there. And it's just a fun, it's just a fun course also. Say, I would just like to echo on that, that I did not take any trial classes because I was not at all interested in trial work. Um, I liked the administrative part of immigration law and did not think I would ever find myself in immigration court. And now I do it quite a bit. Um, and so I kind of had to learn on the job and from coworkers, which is doable, but I really wish that I had had that foundation. So if like me, you think you're never going into court, I would still advise you to try try it while you're in law school. I want to talk a little bit about qualities or skills, which are kind of a, a little bit of a, a mushy subject in a way. But if you had to distill for us the qualities that make for a good immigration lawyer, a good in any of your areas, what would those skills or qualities be? I think empathy is huge in the world of immigration. Um, you are going to hear, I, I can't even tell you the, the, the full gambit on things uh, that your clients have gone through. Um, so you need to develop um, some self-care, uh, ways to care for yourself and your own mental health in the beginning. Um, even now, even if you're in, you know, uh, undergrad right now, I, I recommend trying to figure out those ways because immigration is a heavy field. I imagine uh, my, the other two can ex express more about that in the last four years, um, but it's heavy. You're, you're literally, many times you are using whatever your client's worst traumatic experience is, and that's the basis for their relief. And so you have to help prepare them to be cross-examined by a government attorney about the most intimate and traumatic and difficult details of their life. Now, that's from the world that I look at, which is you know detained courts and things like that. Um, I know the business world is different, um, but you go through a lot of that. You walk through people through the, the, the worst parts of their life on a daily basis. Um, it's also very, very rewarding though, because when you get their green cards and they can stay and they can remain with their family, it's, it's great or citizenship or, or, or what, or, you know, what is it? I think writing skills is, is a huge part of being an immigration attorney. You can be an immigration attorney and never be in court. Um, so I, I think writing, um, good citations, which again, law review can help you with and your legal methods professors um, and whatnot. Um, and I think at least on this side of the field, it being an advocate, because sometimes the laws are just, they just don't make sense in reality when you have your clients sitting in front of them. And so you need to be able to figure out how to be creative and work an appeal to be able to try to get it up and try to change the law or, um, work in the you know policy advocacy side of things to be able to to work towards greater change 
And then if you choose to, I think immigration law is an odd field that you can combine a lot of what it is to be a social worker with being a lawyer. Um, depending on, you know, what area you land on, you know, sometimes your clients, you know, barely speak English and they don't know how to navigate the community and you need them to get fingerprints or something like that. And you've got to help them through, through all kinds of things. Um, so if you like that side of things, and that goes equally for private practice and nonprofit work in the immigration field, which I don't think necessarily you get in other fields. Maybe I'm just biased because I love immigration law, but um, that that's my other plug is it, if you choose, it can be a combination of a bit of social work and um, lawyering. I completely agree with all of that. <laughs> um, and some of the more practical skills, um, I have found, and maybe this is specific to um, being nonprofit, um, you sometimes have very high caseloads. So organization is very key. Um, the thing about immigration is that you will get an application ready um, and then you send it out and it sits for months or years. And then all of a sudden you will come back to getting a request for more evidence. And inevitably, it seems like you get 10 of those for clients all at the same time um, with varying deadlines. You might have court deadlines. So if you're like me and you're doing what we call benefits work as well as uh, defense work, there are a lot of uh, deadlines that you're juggling. Um, and so good organization skills are really important. And then client management, um, I think there are two aspects to this. One specific to immigration is that waiting times are very long um, and they only seem to increase. And so being really clear upfront with your clients, I guess this goes into good communication skills as well, um, being clear upfront with what the process looks like, how long it's going to take, and then checking in every so often. Um, and um, just kind of, they, you know, they have this idea of what should happen and what can happen and you know what's actually possible. And so, you know, being firm, but nice and, and explaining that discrepancy. Um, and then, you know, having that kind of um, continual communication and being a good communicator, both with your clients, but also, you know, with the immigration agencies, you might have to reach out and have good um, connections to, you know, the government attorneys, the ICE attorneys. Um, and so being very professional and having those good communication skills can be helpful. I would just add, I think you have to be a little bit resilient because it's kind of a tough field and the rules change on you all the time. Um, and you kind of have to pick yourself up and keep going and believe in what you're doing and know that you're going to get there eventually. Um, I have one example of a client who um, came to me and he's a biomedical engineer who was on a J1 um, visa, which is kind of like a research scholar exchange visa. Um, and he was at Stanford and he was developing a really great medical device and a spinoff company. But there's no visa for spinoff companies of medical devices, even though we should really keep those, um, encourage those, that type of work in the United States. So we filed um, an EB1 green card petition for him, which you can self-sponsor. And I had filed tons of these in the past. He was super qualified and USCIS just denied it. It was my first ever denial. And it was clear that the officer didn't read half of what we submitted and really just didn't care. Um, so that was so frustrating, um, as you can imagine. And we then I went turned around and filed a different type of petition for him, which is a national interest waiver. Um, and we just found out a few days ago that it got approved and it was, you know, several years in the making and he had put all his faith and confidence in me. Um, and we even had to file his green card application with it, which we don't like to do because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, but it ended up work, working out and it just goes to show some of the subjectivity that comes into it too, because one petition can be approved and a very similar petition can be denied. So you really have to kind of have that a little bit of resilience, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of patience um, to, to really keep going, even when the landscape is always changing. And what a case that might have been approved, you know, a few years ago might not be approved and vice versa. Um, so I try to tell myself to just kind of keep going, <laughs> be resilient and having good coworkers helps with that also, because they can kind of pick you up when you've had um, maybe a little bit of a challenging day. That also highlights another great skill, which is creativity. Um, so in the immigration field, laws are changing a lot um, and there is a lot that's up to discretion. And so um, 
you know, you may have to think, okay, well, this application, this petition didn't work. What else can we do? Or even getting creative with your arguments. And so something I think people have known for a long time, and it's just becoming more of an issue, is that there are a lot of racial biases in the immigration laws. And so, you know, there's nothing that says races, you know, or discrimination is happening explicitly, but, you know, we see it happening. And so in getting creative in your arguments, um, and so, you know, we're kind of pushing back on discretion. So for example, you know, they may look at um, whether somebody's had stable employment or um, owns a house or has contact with law enforcement. And so you can put the facts on the paper of all of those things, but you know, that doesn't highlight the fact that policing is higher in communities of color or that people with mental health issues aren't able to find stable housing all, always. And so being creative in how you're approaching even <clears throat> what might seem like a black and white issue um, in the immigration law, but just really advocating well for your client. We did have one question from somebody and it's gonna be like a quick lightning round. They were curious about your undergraduate majors. Spanish and Hispanic studies. French and legal studies. I did uh, Spanish political science and global studies. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, clinic and co-op, what we call experiential learning at Drexel. So um, it's one of the cornerstones of the education here at the law school. Um, Rebecca mentioned that she did her clinic um, in the appellate litigation clinic and was describing that how it was supervised. Can you tell us about um, Christina and Danielle? Can you tell us about your co-op or clinic experience and what that entailed? I did a co-op for my last semester of law school at the Arlington Immigration Court, which is also within the Department of Justice. So I was sort of helping attorneys like Rebecca with some of the research and some of the initial drafting of the decisions. We worked directly with the immigration judges um, it was it was just such a wonderful experience. It was hands down uh, one of the best part of my law school experiences. Um, and I, um, you know, got to know some of the judges really well. And um, they would even take us out to lunch sometimes and do things like that. And it, it just felt like being a part of a community, even though at that point I was, um, I was in um, Virginia and was away from my law school community per se. I had another community that I was joining. So um, I think the co-op program is really amazing. It's, it's fantastic. And um, it's something that um, I think really sets Drexel apart. And in talking with my colleagues um, from other law schools that I work with now, they can't believe I had an experience like that as a law student. So definitely recommend it. I agree. Do co-op, do experiential learning. Um, I did two. Um, so I did a part-time co-op um, my 2L year with Friends of Farm Workers. And um, it was really great because it gave me that experience of having that intersection between labor employment law and immigration law. Um, and um, I actually was able to, um, so I put in a plug for using your pro bono hours requirement as well. So one L year, I was able to do the pro bono project they had at HIAS um, doing immigration work. So I was working with special immigrant juveniles um, and doing DACA. And so because I had that experience from pro bono work, I got to incorporate that into my co-op experience, even though the organization didn't normally do that work because I had that experience, I was able to help um, the children of some of my, um, some of the clients of the organization do that. And then I continued to volunteer for them after the co-op um, as part of my pro bono hours. And um, my last semester of law school, I moved back to Minnesota and did a full-time co-op at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And even though it's not at all related to immigration, it was a great experience. Um, I did get to see court experience. I got to see mediations. Um, and I was also then connected to the place where I wanted to find a job. And so I was able to network um, through the attorneys that I was meeting at that co-op um, with the connections that they had. So it was really great. And as I said, because I had that pro bono experience at highest, the co-op experience of Friends of Farm Workers, my 2L summer was, was a more rewarding experience. I was able to do more um, because I was really prepared. By the time that I, I came out of law school, I really did feel ready to be an attorney. Um, 
And I agree with Christina, that is not the case for a lot of other attorneys I've met coming right out of law school. Thank you. There was a question, and we have to wrap up soon, but there was a quick question about the difference, the difference between clinic and co-op. And I will just say it very briefly because it is on the law school website, but it helps to explain it. Think of it as two separate buckets. Um, co-op is where you're matched with an actual employer whether that's a law firm, a public interest organization, it can be a judge or an agency. And you're like working for them 25 hours a week with a course at the law school on the, on the back end. So you're actually very practically involved and it's um, at least nine credits, I believe. Um, but we can, I can double check that. And um, it's a very rich in-depth experience as you've heard clinics are offered through the law school under the supervision of professors who um, are wa working with you to bring a case um, into the court system with a live client, a singular person. And so these are much more, they're small. There's usually in between four and six law students in a clinic, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. They're both equally wonderful. Different students like to do different things. It's the sort of thing where faculty advising can help you make that decision. But either way, both clinic and co-op help to make you a practice-ready attorney when you graduate from law school and give you the confidence that you need to get that first job and strike out as a lawyer. If anyone has any questions, please uh, email either me or Ina Halili. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank our panelists, Professor Anil Kalhan, uh, Christina, and Danielle, and um, Rebecca. Thank you so much for spending time with us and thank you for sharing your experiences. It was really a wonderful evening.